So the message that I have that to spring here for a few minutes today is, is not necessarily a Mother's Day message. That's not what God laid on my heart to speak about. But I've been thinking this week about um, the great mercy and love of God and His all-knowing compassion and how God sees things so much different than people see things. And I'm actually going to read today from Hebrews chapter 11. And this is, this is called, this is considered the roll call of faith. So Paul was speaking in this whole chapter about faith. And so what he did is he went back in the Old Testament and, and he started naming people that were known, that had faith in God. And he, he, he started, he named, he talked about Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and uh, Isaac and Jacob and uh, Joseph and Moses and he goes on and talks of, of uh, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and of the prophets. He said, Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. Uh, but in the middle of this faith chapter where he's talking about all these heroes of faith, this really stood out to me. He talks about a prostitute talks about a prostitute. He said in verse, in chapter, Hebrews 11, verse 31. Verse 31 of Hebrews 11. By faith, the harlot, or the prostitute, Rahab, perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. And, you know, that really stood out to me this week as I thought about this, and I thought about of God and the way He sees people. Because the Bible tells us that God looks on the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God sees the hearts of people. And, and, and you can see someone, and, and, and in fact, we'll just take the example of, of King David when he was about to be anointed king. And uh, Samuel went to uh, his father's house to anoint a king because God told him to do that. And so he had all his sons, Jesse, bring his sons out because Samuel was going to choose a king from among those sons. Actually, God was going to choose it. God was going to tell Samuel, this is the one and you anoint him. Well, David, the youngest son, he was out keeping the sheep that day and they didn't even call him to the sacrifice, to the feast. He was not even called because they just knew there was no way that shepherd boy was going to become a king. But God told Samuel that day, He said, Don't look on the outward appearance, for man, God seeth not as man seeth. For man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And aren't you glad that way many years before this was written, hundreds of years actually, when Joshua and the children of Israel were going to go possess the promised land that God had promised them, the first city that they were going to come to was Jericho. And so they had to take that city first. And it was a walled city, had big walls around it. So uh, Joshua told two spies, he said, you go spy out Jericho. And so they did. They went to Jericho, and what they did, if you think about it, this was pretty smart, actually. Yeah. They went into a prostitute's house and hid, because if they would have got caught, of course, then they would have been killed. But so apparently, you know, because they went into a prostitute's house and it was normal for people to come and go from that sort of a situation, then they weren't, uh, uh, you know, caught. But But... Anyway, uh, so I think about this. There was something in Rahab, that prostitute, there was something in her heart that God saw. God saw an honesty. And everybody else in that city died. Everybody. When they took the city. Except Rahab and her family, the ones that she brought, because what they did is they made a deal with her. They said, I tell you, we tell you what we'll do. When we come take this city, 
you, everybody in your family, you bring them into your house. And they must be in your house. And if they're in your house, you're going to live. But if they step outside your door, then, then that's not our problem. And that's exactly what happened when the walls of Jericho fell down by some miraculous intervention. Her house stayed standing. And Joshua told those two spies, he said, you go get Rahab and bring her out. And she was saved. But isn't it amazing how out of all the people in Jericho, God saw a prostitute's heart that her heart was right. Her heart wanted to serve, do right. Her heart wanted to serve God. She believed God. In fact, I'm going to read you just a little bit of what she had to say. When the spies went to her house, this is what she had to say to them. Part of it. And I'm going to go back in the book of Joshua. And uh, starting with verse 8, before they were laid down, she came up under them up on the roof. That's where she had them hid. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side, Jordan, Sihon, and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now why did a prostitute know that? Why didn't everybody else know that? Because she had, there was something in her heart that God saw that was honest. And my point being that God sees hearts. God doesn't see people as they are. He sees honest hearts and He forgives. I'm not saying today that, that God uh, wants us to go on. He didn't expect Rahab to go on in her, what do you call it, job? <laughs> not yeah. job, whatever. He, he didn't expect her to continue that job. He expected her to change that job. He rescued her out of that because she had an honest heart. So when God sees people, like we see people all the time, we see down and out people, we see alcoholics, we see drug addicts, we see uh, all these things, all these people that need God, and God is looking on their heart, and sometimes they are the ones with the honest hearts. And God is looking at them and God is going to reach them somehow and He might use you and me to do it. Yes. He might use us. He might. That's why it's so important for us not to shun people. We need to reach out to people. doesn't matter what kind of people they are. We need to reach out to them. In fact, Jesus, I tell you, it's one of the reasons I believe the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders of Jesus' day, they had a terrible time with Jesus. They just, I mean, they had everything, you know, all cut and dried in, in a box the way they did things. And here comes Jesus. And he starts going to sinners' houses and eating with them. He starts going to publicans' houses. People, now a publican, let me tell you, a publican in that day was kind of like a crooked IRS agent. They were a tax collector, but what they did, they, they were cheaters. Most all of them were cheaters. And what they did, let's say that, that Rome was charging a tax of 10%. Well, the publican, he would just tell people, you owe 15%. And he, he pocketed the other five. So most of them were thieves, and they were hated by the people. But Jesus, he reached out to people like that. Jesus touched people that no one else wanted to touch. He touched lepers. He touched crippled people. He reached out to sinners. That woman at the well that, that had a reputation, Jesus loved her and reached out to her. The woman that was taken in adultery that day and the scribes and the Pharisees brought this woman to Jesus. And they said, Jesus, the law says we should stone this woman. What do you say? What? Yes, yes. And Jesus said, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And then when everybody left and there was just Jesus and the woman, what did Jesus say? He looked up and he said to the woman, he said, woman, where's your accusers? Hath no man condemned you? She said, no man, Lord. Jesus said, I don't either. But listen to what he said. He said, go and sin no more. Yes. Yes. 
Go and sin no more. You don't keep committing adultery. You stop. When Jesus forgives, you stop. Whatever your sin is that you're committing, when Jesus comes along and He sees your heart, you stop and then you, he, he gives you victory in that. But you know, I was thinking about this also yesterday, I believe it was. I was thinking about forgiveness and God's forgiveness. Isn't God's forgiveness awesome? Yes. It's awesome. I, I, I was thinking, what if... What if you got down to pray? You know, when, when you become a Christian, you've repented of your sins and God has forgiven you. What if you got down to pray and you said, God, I thank you for forgiving me of all my sins. And, and God says, yes, yes, I've forgiven you, but I still remember that time in 1982 when you stole something. I still remember that time on such and such a date when you did this or you did that. I, oh, I forgive you for it. But I still remember it. Aren't you glad God's not like that? Oh, I'm so glad God... You know, I know people like that, don't you? I know people like that who just refuse to let things go. But you know, when we, when God forgives us, He lets it go. It's gone. As far as the east from the west, He's removed our transgressions. It is gone and when we forgive people that's how we have to treat them also and the people god has forgiven we must also treat them that way so uh now i know that we don't have a magical ability to erase everything in our mind that people have done to us i realize that but i do want to tell you this that when you have truly forgiven somebody you won't even want to remember what they did you won't want to remember because you've forgiven. God has forgiven. And, and so we thank God today for His awesome mercy that God is looking to. Remember the story, remember the parable about the feast that, that the king was having and he sent out messengers to go invite people to his feast. Jesus told this parable. And he sent people, and messengers, that go invite people to my feast. And they made excuses. They didn't want to come. And so what did Jesus say? The, he said, the, the king, he said, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. Go call the cripple. Go call the maimed. Go call the blind. Go call these people that are cast out, cast away from society. Go call them to my feast. And they'll come. They'll come. The other people are too self-righteous. They, 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 some of them think they're too holy, think they're too good, don't have time. But the outcasts, they're the ones, oftentimes, that'll come. They know they need help. And uh, God has called us today to be the salt and the light of the earth. God has called us to reach out to people. I'll tell you just a little quick story on myself. So I've been having service here in this chapel for... How long? At least a year, maybe going on two. I have a neighbor over across the street, Jimmy, and he told me a story one time about what happened to him years ago. He said, I used to be saved. I went to church faithfully when he was a young man. But he said, I got in some trouble in my teens. And he, he got, I believe he was selling drugs. He got into trouble and he got sent to prison. He said, I got out of prison and I went back to church. And he said, those people treated me like I was an outcast. They shunned me. He said, I walked out the door, never been back. <laughs> Forty years, he wouldn't step back in church because people who are supposed to have the love of God in their hearts for sinners, didn't have it. And God spoke to me this week and He said, you know what? You've never invited Jimmy to your chapel services. He might not even know he's welcome. Yeah, I have a sign out there that says welcome or whatever. But he might not know he's welcome because of his past experience. So I called him. He wasn't home yesterday. I called him. And I said, I just want you to know you're welcome at our chapel. You're welcome. We'd love to have you. He said, and you know what surprised me? What surprised me the most? 
He said, you know, me and my wife, we've actually talked about coming. <laughs> and I, he probably will. He probably will sometime. But, you know, it, it, it was just kind of uh, woke me up and made me realize Sorry. there are people that are hurting that need God. And God knows their hearts. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe God is going to use me to reach Jimmy. Who knows? I don't know. Maybe God is going to use you, you and you and you, to reach people that He sees they have an honest heart like Rahab. And they would be like the last people that we would think would come to church, right? But God is looking at their heart. He's saying they have an honest heart. I love them. They're mine. I want to tell you today, you know what's very int- what, what I love about God? God loves the down and out alcoholic drug addict just as much as He loves the church goer. Amen. Just as much. Jesus died for them. Just like He died for the man in the suit or the woman in the fancy dress. He died for them. He paid the price for them just as much as He did anybody else. And He loves them that much. It is not our place to judge. It is not our place to determine who needs God and who doesn't. Everybody needs God. Everybody needs God. Everybody needs His love. So, today, I'm going to close, but I just wanted to remind us of the love and faithfulness of God. And how God sees hearts. And I want to tell you, I believe everybody in this place today has a heart that wants to follow God because you wouldn't be here if you did. And because God sees that. And I want to tell you, God is going to honor that. I tell you, I'll just say this. I I built this chapel, but it's not mine. That's what I tell God. It's not mine. I said, it's yours. He just lets me take care of it. (laughs) <laughs> he just lets me maintain it I'm, I'm like the maintenance guy but I want to tell you this anybody and everybody is welcome here bring us the alcoholics bring us the adulterers uh, bring us the cheaters bring us the life bring everybody come on in here because in here you're going to feel the love of God you're going to feel the love of God we're not going to exclude you in here We're not going to look down on you because you're different from us. We're going to love you. And I want to present that challenge to every one of us today. Can you say amen to that if somebody comes in here? Can we do that? Can we love them? Amen. Amen. Can we? We can open our arms and we can say, I'm glad you're here. I probably (laughs) told this story probably told this story before, but real quick. I'm going to tell, tell you this story right quick before I close. When I was building this chapel, I had the floor built, and I had no walls yet. And it was a Saturday, and I had limited time to work on this chapel because I work for a living. So I love my Saturdays. I love just coming out here. I mean, it's so relaxing. Yesterday I worked on over here on this cabin over here. And it's just so relaxing. And so I'm focused, you know. I, I've got to build this chapel. And I was, so I, and um, uh, Jay can relate to this. So I had my wall, my first wall right here. This first wall. I had it laid on the floor. And when you're building walls, you nail them together on the floor and you stand them up. So there I was, I was nailing together my wall down here on this floor and I looked down the road and I saw two people walking down the road, which is pretty unusual out here in the country. And I remember thinking to myself, I hope they don't come over here and bother me. (laughs) Now I'm telling on myself. And and the reason was because, like I said, my time was limited. I'm trying to get as much built as I can that day. And I, I said, I hope they don't come over here and bother me. And they come walking down the road. And sure enough, they saw me right here on this, on this floor. And they come walking right over here to me. 
And what had happened, they told me their story. They had rode out here that night. I don't know if they were partying. I don't know what they were doing. But they got stranded somehow and left. Their, their company left them. They got stranded. They live in town, Fort Smith, I believe. And so I'm thinking to myself, uh, okay. And so I started, you know, I got to thinking, you know, they've been up all night long. They're probably hungry. So I said, you guys hungry? Yeah. So I went over to the house and I had just made, I'm not a great baker, but I had just made some homemade banana nut bread. And I went over and I cut them both a big slice of banana nut bread and brought them back a drink. And right here I gave it to them and they ate. And then Matthew, my son, he wasn't married then. He was going to town to go to work a little bit later that morning. So they caught a ride with him into town and, and we, we helped him out. But my point here that I want to make to you is that God spoke to my heart that day. And he says, this is what it's all about. He said, here you are building a chapel for me. And you don't want to be bothered by someone walking down the road. And he says, that's what it's all about. That you might be bothered. That you might touch people. And uh, that was a lesson for me that day I've never forgot. Okay, God, bring them on in then. Let them come walking down the road. Whatever. That's what it's all about. It's not about so much what I had to do that particular day or even my, my, my goal, which was, which was uh, you might say, was, was worthy. It was, a, it was a worthy goal to get this built. But even more important than getting the chapel built that day was people's hearts, people's lives, and people's relationship with God. So that's even more important. Amen. And so anyway, uh, I pray today that God will help us. And that, of course, my, my, my main goal is that each one of us will have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah. That you will experience, if you have not, I don't know everybody's situation, but if you have not experienced that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, yes. your forgive, forgiveness of sins and, and, and realize the peace and joy that come when you surrender to Him, then that, of course, is my first and foremost goal is that you would find that today. You would experience the forgiveness and joy that Jesus gives. Simply by asking, you know, I would go back to that woman taken in adultery. I think about her. She didn't even ask Jesus. She was just uh, you know, uh, uh, caught there. She was in a bad situation. But Jesus knew her heart. And Jesus forgave her. Today, Jesus is still in the forgiving business. I, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter. It does not matter your past. Oh, thank God it doesn't matter your past. Amen. Uh -huh. Because when Jesus, when He forgives, your past is gone. Yes. It's gone. As far as He's concerned, it's gone. I, used, we used to, I told you I used to be involved in a jail ministry in Fort Smith. And I used to tell those guys up there, I say, when, when you, you may have a record for the rest of your life, some of you. But I said, when God forgives you, He doesn't keep records. They're gone. They're gone. So today, we're going to have a time of prayer. We invite everybody. Spend a few minutes. We invite you to spend a few minutes getting to know this Jesus, this healer, this forgiver, this master who loves you more than you can even comprehend today. So we're gonna we're gonna do that. We're gonna close. Have a have a time.